Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am very pleased to be joined today by Fireplace Guy, uh, whose actual name is Len Antares. Hey, thank you very much. So we've been, I've been filming with Len for many years now, um, and he's got a really impressive collection of really cool firearms, a bunch of which you guys have seen, although you may not know that they're his. So I figured it'd be perfect to uh, give people an opportunity to ask you some questions. Well, and thank you very much, but you know, I'm not working, so I really hope these are softball questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the answers are over there, right? Yes, I have all the answers on my uh, cheat Okay, sheet. so if I forget okay. the answers, you're going to help me? No. Oh, oh, oh. No, you're okay. totally out Go ahead. here. All right. So, uh, first off, let's point out that you have written a couple books. Correct. Um, an early Astro <laughs> book, which is long gone, and then, like, the world's greatest last word tome on Astros. And pretty much the same on stars. Like the two go-to references on Spanish pistols are right there and they're yours. Yeah, well, thank you very much. It's taken a tremendous amount of effort. And for all of you guys out there who might have started an article for, say, the American Rifleman or Guns and Ammo or Shooting Times, writing a book really is a labor of love. And um, unless your name is Ian McCollum, you usually do it just because it's a, it's a passion, Oh, I not did, really a vocation. I did mine absolutely as a passion. So, I, you've got the two huge books. I've just got the one little... Yeah, thing. but but you've got gold gilt around yours. That's true. It's so fancy. in terms of you know value, we're kind of talking about the same. <laughs> and in terms of the interest, I would we kind of talked about books at one point. I would never have guessed there was this much interest in French rifles. Oh, people just don't pay people, attention to how cool they were. Well, are. you know the thing is, it's important to be ahead of the pack. And we've talked about too in terms of investing in arms, right? You That's always true. want to be ahead of the pack. Sometimes you're so far ahead of the pack, though. <laughs> They never catch up. You've lapsed but, the pack, and now that, it just looks like you're exactly in the That's exactly right. So anyway, but uh, you've done a great job with your um, French rifles, and now they're a legion of French rifle yes. collectors. Yeah. So congratulations there. All right. Let's get anyway. into some questions. Yes. The first one I have is from Patrick, and that is, why are American collectors so interested in Swiss arms? Well, I would say that um, they're, well, Swiss arms are fascinating. And if you're a collector, you've always kind of held up the Swiss arms as, you know, kind of a, a pedestal of, of perfectionism and, and well-machined guns, which are extremely accurate. And, you know, we probably talked about previously the P-49 being recognized as the best military pistol ever made. But overall, I don't think that there's a large group of Swiss collectors in the United States. And one of the ways that would maybe underscore that conversation is that if there were a large group of Swiss collectors, we'd see a large number of reference books about Swiss guns in English, and you don't see that. So if you're interested in some early Swiss guns, maybe you would use Azel's book, but for the most part, the, the preponderance of books out there, the new, of course, um, Vickers Guide text accepted, but for the most part, the reference books are in German. So well, even though we hold Swiss arms in high esteem, I don't think that there are a lot of a lot of collectors of Swiss arms. I would tend to agree. And frankly, the Vickers Guidebook, which we were both, we both participated right. in, uh, that's not a reference book. There's, some inf there's good information in it, but it's not intended to be a reference book. There's nothing like this or that for Swiss Correct. guns. You want an 1882 Swiss revolver? Not much That's there. exactly right. You're going to have to, guys, you're going to have to search for that. And, you know, there, for the record, there are several variations of the 1882, but I don't see that there's a really long line. I mean, if you want one with a shoulder stock, they tend to be pricey, but there's not a long line of people. And especially there's not a long line of knowledgeable people who can talk about all those different variations. You want a book, you want some knowledge about some Colts or Walthers or Mausers or Winchesters. There's a host of reference of books. Yeah. which reflects there being a legion of collectors, not so much for the Swiss. I tend to agree. Uh, next question is from Lord Bacon, who wants to know, why were early auto-loading pistols so clunky compared to modern pistols? Well, I guess what I'd say is beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> Maybe they weren't so clunky. I mean, some of them, for example, some of the uh, early monlickers are considered to be amongst the most elegant semi-auto pistols ever made. They but, really are. But I do understand that, you know, if we're going to kind of generalize with uh, broad brushes, I do understand that perspective. And, and what I can say is, 
In many cases, elegance and refinement is not something that just jumps out of the box or falls out of the shelf. It's built on, a, on iterative improvements. And when you look at the earliest semi-auto pistols, there was no standardization of ammunition. There was no standardization of mechanisms. I mean, for you know, some of you are aware that some of the early semi-autos were blow forward. Okay, forget about the um, forget about there even being a lock breech mechanism. They couldn't even they didn't even know what a lock breech mechanism was back then. So I think for the time, yeah, again, putting in perspective, you know, these are early developments right after the inception or the um, you know, the invention of smokeless powder. So we didn't have standardized ammunition. We didn't have roughly standardized mechanisms. These are all inventors who are thinking out of the box. And some things, you know, by our perspective now are, are looked upon as clunky and uh, ineffective. But at that time, they were really novel, innovative, and cutting edge. So I think that's really important when you, when you look at these early guns. And there's certainly a motivation to get something on the market instead of spending 10 years perfecting it. This is a, you know, it's a dynamic, rapidly evolving market early in self-loading pistols. And what, you know, maybe you get your kind of clunky, it works, but it's not gorgeous pistol available. And you can get an interest in a big company that can help you market it and make it a success. Or you can wait five years, make it in something really nice. And by then the whole market will have moved on and, and you're out of luck. You know, the other thing that we, we kind of forget about is, is now with uh, modern technology, you know, ideas, they're, they're patented. I mean, you can't steal the ideas exactly, but you can take concepts and modify them. You know, when these guns were made, you know, there was no television, there's no radio, of course there was no internet, so people are kind of working, uh, you know, by themselves alone in the basement and just trying to figure out just the most basic concepts. Yeah. And then if a basic concept doesn't work, there's maybe not a big team of engineers and they can't say, hey, what's Glock doing and what's Colt doing? Because, you know, that kind of information might take months for them to um, to arrive and you know for those ideas to be assimilated so they truly were working on their own in many cases so anyway it's it's just very different and it's it's always easy to criticize the competition or criticize other people when you really don't put yourselves in their um, you know in their footsteps uh, rune suggests your house is on fire and you can only save one gun from your collection Well, well, you kind of um, gave me a little prelude. A, I did a, a tell little, you what little, the questions uh, were going to be. You did so tell you me a little bit. Of, yeah, so I did a thing of that. And, and I'd say in this case, I, I have twins. Okay. Okay, and the twins are together in one bedroom. So <laughs> I can gather both twins up at the same time and bring them both out of the house safely. Okay, so we'll let I, you tweak the question. Uh, okay, I'm going to tweak the question or kind of game the situation a little bit. But in this case, I've, I've got several areas of interest. One is, of, of course, you guys know, it's, you know, early design semi-automatics, whether it's handguns or, or long guns. But I also have a little bit of a, you know, a, a, a personal, almost a fetish when it comes to some of the gold damascene guns. So anyway, so I've got two twins. They're fraternal twin, twins in a sense. So um, one of them would be a Salvatore Dormus. And I know for many of you, you know, you're not even familiar with that uh, pistol, but it is actually the first patented semi-automatic. So if you're interested in early design guns, what could be better than the first patented semi-automatic. So it's not a Borsard, it's the Salvatore Dormus. And it actually went into production, and military was tested, proof, tested. tested by the Austrian military. Yeah. So yeah. it's a gun that didn't really go anywhere. No, but then what, it immediately went, pfft, yeah, but, it, but, but was, was there. But was recognized, <laughs> and yeah. it, was a, it was a start from scratch semi-automatic. It wasn't like one of the Schoenberger lawmen's that started life as a repeater and was just tweaked to be a semi-auto. But anyway, I have a video on that gun that I will link in the description text below if you want to know all about it. What, the Schoenberger Lawman or the Salvatore Dormus? Well, both, but I, I was I, thinking the Salvatore Dormus. Look at the Salvatore Dormus, it's really much better. But um, in any event, then the other one, uh, with, in keeping with my interest in gold damascene guns I, and my interest, of course, in some of the, the um, Spanish items, is that uh, you've got the star. But well, this is the gold, Astro. Gold okay. damascene it's gold, is everywhere. It, that's right. The gold damascene is everywhere. In fact, we've got gold, <laughs> gold damascene on the back of both of these books. But in any event, um, there is, I, I kind of like broom handles. So there's an Astra 902. It's a semi automatic 20 shot broom handle. 
and it's uh, gorgeously gold, gold damascened in its case oh, it's with a the matching work. shoulder stock and and really i have to say that would be the uh second twin that would be tucked under my arm okay i think i can't argue with those choices yeah. like yeah yeah for sure Next. Um, let's see. Alexander asks, how did you start collecting firearms and why a particular interest in early semi-autos? Is that Alexander, my son? Did he write you that? It's possible. I don't know. Oh, okay. Well, well, Alexander, that's a very good question. And um, one of the things that actually always has um, intrigued me is um, kind of exploring new areas. So, for example, if you asked me something about a uh, Colt 1911 or 11A1, those are wonderful guns. And, but there's a lot of information out there. So if you ask me about something, something else, I'd say, well, those are also wonderful guns, but I can't find out, and I'm interested in finding out, and how can I research this? So, you know, back in the day, and were you born then when I started doing this? I, I'm not sure. You were probably running around in diapers or something. But I wasn't anyway, I, I thought that the Spanish guns were really, really underappreciated and had some wonderful designs, were very attractive designs, and they were obviously held in high esteem by at least uh, the Spanish Armed Forces. And for those guys out there who don't think that much of the Spanish Armed Forces, let me point out that when the, uh, you know, when the Nazis had some clout, they also liked very much some of the Spanish guns, particularly guns made by Astra and Star. So in any event, there was no material out there and I thought it would be very interesting to maybe write an article about uh, Astra and Star. I was more interested in article. Astra's because, well, it started out that way. And then I realized, well, gee, these are kind of interesting guns. And, and I, I combed through the American literature and there's really very little definitive about them. I mean, there'd be, several, correct. There, there'd be several definitive paragraphs, but nothing about production numbers. There's no background. And... And anyway, I think they were just largely dismissed as, you know, pieces of iron made of, um, you know, soft pork, Spanish pork, steel, of, of soft Spanish <laughs> steel. Exactly. Which really, in, in some cases, some of the guns do have some quality uh, control issues. But for the most part, the products by Astra, Star and some of the better known um, uh, firms making Spanish shotguns, they're really their first class products that I, I think are not collectible because this kind of misconception has been carried forward. So in any event, I started doing more research, which was an excuse to do some uh, field trips to uh, northern Spain. And um, I es established some interesting relationships with both the, um, the people at Astra and later Star, and then once again going back to Astra. And it was very satisfying to actually uncover some of the background with respect to these guns. And, and you guys know if you like collecting, you buy one thing and then you see something else and you say, oh gosh, the rear sight's a little bit different or that grip's different. I wonder if the grip's factory original. Well, what about this magazine? And hey, is that factory engraving, yes or no? And, and actually you open one door with one question and, and here are 10 more questions and they all seem interesting and they all should be answered. And at the end of the day, you've got so much information that what you thought would be one or two, maybe a, a small series of articles, ends up as a book and then time goes on technology improves you know they've got a, a variety of different software programs to select from you move from film to digital photography the lighting gets improved and you you look at your first effort and you say boy i can do so much better than that and you know in the same time and, and ian knows this too like when you start out and you say i think i'm going to write a book and people say yes you're going to write a book so how can we help you and they're being very patronizing, trying to be patient, but deep in their heart, they know they'll help you and absolutely nothing comes of their assistance. I mean, again, you guys might not know, but I get asked all the time to supply information to people who are ostensibly going to be writing a book and writing an article. And anymore, I say, show me your first completed chapter. If you've really written a completed chapter, I know you're serious. But if all you want is me to supply you with a bunch of pictures and information, I'm sorry, it's not going to lead to anything, and it's just a waste of my time. So, and, and I think, Ian, also when you started and you were visiting with people, you know, maybe some people opened some doors, but it's not only, it's only after you've been around for a while and you've, you know, you, you're found to be reputable and um, insightful and knowledgeable and discreet that people kind of you know, let you come yeah. into their fold, and all of a sudden, 
what seemed to be a little crack in the door frame as a wide open doorway. So, you know, after I finished my first Astro book, I'll tell you, the reception I got at Star was completely different. And then when I went back to some of the folks at Astra afterwards, they said, well, you know, that first book you did with, with our company, that was really nice. But, you know, we can you do something a little bit better? I mean, it wasn't quite like that. And then afterwards, when I asked for information, you know, your name gets out there. And, you know, now you're like Gundy Jesus, and I can't hope to compete with that. But, you know, I do have a number of titles behind my name. And mm -hmm. it's, it's very satisfying. People know that you're serious. Yeah. And... Um, you get to um, you know, explore different collections, and I find that really very, very satisfying. Nice. So, our next question is do, 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 from Walker. Why do you think the majority of modern firearms have lost the finesse and the finish of guns from yesteryear? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, who has it said just follow the money? And that's, I, I think, really the bottom line. Um, but, but I think that's only part of the answer. For one thing, in, in times past, labor was a lot cheaper. So you could put a lot more effort and a lot more time into a particular gun. And, you know, as with many businesses I know now, it's a, a, the machinery costs a lot. But, you know, in, in real life, I, asked, I act as a physician, and usually my biggest cost is the, uh, is the personal overhead. And I think in many companies, it's just, you know, it's, sure, the planes cost a lot, but, you know, one of the biggest ongoing costs is, you know, how much do the pilots cost and the stewards and the stewardesses and, the, uh, and all of the, the human infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I, I think if you're a firearms manufacturer in the past, that was also a, a major concern as how much did you have to pay for the people? And their relative cost years ago was much less than it is right now. Um, so I think the cost of the, the human input the, to finish the firearms was much less then than it is now. And the other thing that's really changed too is what, what people like and perceive as a modern arm. I mean, I think that even back in the 50s and 60s, if you were making like black guns as we have now, I think they would be largely eschewed and people would snub their noses at them. They say, well, these aren't real guns. I mean, these are plasticky things that, you know, that look cheap. They don't feel like guns and we're not going to give them a second thought. Now, if it's not a plastic gun, you almost have to explain, well, why isn't it made of a high impact polymer? And why hasn't it been molded with Picatinny rails? And, um, why doesn't it have some tritium sites or the option for a, a red dot site? So these are things that, you know, that they, they either weren't available years ago or it would have been at such great cost that either the technology was there or the, the added cost would have been unthinkable. So I think it's kind of a combination of things, but, but overall, um, I think it's the human cost and the fact that actually tastes have changed. So if, for example, Glock all of a sudden started to make um, handguns with, that were largely uh, forged and had uh, wood grips. I don't think many of you would even look upon them as Glocks. And they probably, other than an oddity, wouldn't sell very well. I think our cultural expectations have changed. That makes sense. Yeah. Let's see. Nick says, if you could choose any firearms from history, uh, from history through the present day, to hang on the wall above the fireplace, what would be your top three picks? Well, again, Ian and I discussed some of this before, and, and you, you laughed at me, so I'm, I, maybe I should change my picks a little bit. It just wasn't I necessarily mean, what I was expecting. Well, you know, the thing is, if, if you live in, your United, in the United States, I mean, you probably should hang some kind of a flintlock or some kind of a lever action from your fireplace, and it's Probably not going to be a very. Do you own a lever action? Um, I own one Spanish lever. I, I know I own an LT gray. That's the extent of my lever actions. So, anyway, but that wasn't the question. The question is, if I had a like call it a functioning fireplace and room above my fireplace, what would I hang? Well, I'd probably still look to be some kind of a brown bass, or you know, maybe okay. some kind of a, you know, a '66 or '73 or something like that, and. 
you know, but that's really not my kind of gun, so I probably would also include, you know, some kind of a more modern sniper rifle, but if I had guests come in and they weren't, you know, sort of gun-oriented guests, I'd have to quickly take down that sniper rifle and, and put up my, uh, my brown vest because I think that's a socially acceptable gun while well, having a, maybe a Swiss sniper rifle wouldn't be quite as socially acceptable. You can put a ZFK-55 up on yeah, the Yeah, we can, exactly, right. Yeah, yeah we're, right. Okay. So you're going with not personal taste, you're going for culturally accepted classic standard. Well, I'm assuming that, you know, I don't have a lot of company, but when some company comes, I don't want to be culturally offensive to them, right? I'm trying to be sensitive, right? Because okay. really what happens is then people go out and they tell their neighbors, do you know what kind of semi-automatic sniper rifle Antares has over his fireplace? <laughs> <laughs> that just would not play well. Uh, Matt says, what's the most interesting technological dead end to come out of early self-loading pistol design? Well, I don't know. There were so many dead ends. I mean, you could just probably throw a dart and hit several dozen of them. Lever-operated um, manual pistols. Yeah, I mean, well, some of the repeater pistols didn't do particularly well. And, you know, one of the guns that we see fairly frequently and, and in remarkable condition are those Bintners. Okay, yeah. and that's because they they were introduced right on the cusp of semi-automatics, and who would want a repeating pistol when you can get a real semi-automatic, even though the semi-automatics didn't really work that well. But um, in any event, we, I guess the question is maybe which or which what semi-automatic is um is is interesting, and that that was uh, that was defeated over the course of time. And I'd have to say, again, you know, my heart goes out to the Salvatore Dormus people. I really like them, and I, and I like a lot of the, the Bergmans. You know, the Bergmans didn't, weren't the most mechanically adroit, but I think their form, their external form, is very charismatic. But for the record, that was not the way I answered the question when you asked me earlier today. True. What I said was the Sasso, the Italian Sasso, which I like very much, particularly the, the model 1921. I mean, it's a huge semi-automatic, so it combines a bunch of stuff that I really like. It's got some more modern technology, which modern at the time was not high impact polymer. Modern at the time was a sheet metal construction. So it's got sheet metal construction. I've always been partial to early guns with shoulder stocks. The Sasso was uh, cut for a shoulder stock. And it's got this really bizarre magazine, which is basically a, um, it's kind of a, a machine gun belt that's linked together and every time the gun cycles the machine gun belt advances by one notch so it's got this fantastic rotary magazine which is large clunky probably <laughs> totally impractical the gun would be for the record a nightmare to build now but i really like it and of course yeah. like the mausers it's got a tangent rear sight and what more Perfect. could one ask for <laughs> right i'll link to the video on the sasso down in the text as well um, let's see, would the Webley self-loader, this is from Christopher, would the Webley self-loader have been a viable practical pistol for widespread use by the United Kingdom during World War I? And uh, I believe the answer is yes. You know, you kind of look at um, some of the other options that were available at the time. I think the Webley was held in high esteem by British troops. That's a very different question than what do I personally think of the Webley Mark I number one? Um, you know, I don't find it a particularly comfortable gun to handle. I no, don't really like the weight distribution. It's, cl it's clunky and awkward, but does it still fall into the category of early semi-automatics? Yes, I think so. Kind of. Yeah. But it, it went somewhere. Yeah. I mean, original development was, what, so, 1904? That's, exactly. That's, we're talking the really practical stuff didn't show up till basically the C96, 1896. So you're right. within 10 years of the first practical semi-autos. I think that qualifies. And for, but, for England, that was the first semi-automatic. Right. I mean, yeah. uh, certainly England had imported a number of, um, a, a number of C96s, you know, whether it was, um, you know, they were sold through Rigsby, they were sold through a number of other distributors. So, I mean, they were aware of the presence of the C96, but in terms of having a semi-auto of indigenous production, Really, Webley was it. They owned, yeah. the, they owned the field in England, and I think they were good guns for the time. So when it comes to the Webley self-loader being a practical World War I combat gun, the way I would think about it is, which would I rather have going into World War I, a Webley self-loader or a C96 Mauser? 
Right, because both of them were the available. The C-96 was clearly a practical World War I gun, at least insofar as a couple hundred thousand of them were actually used. And frankly, I'd rather have the Webley. I'd rather have the Webley, too. I think it's a, a more effective gun. It's going to be, I'm going to have an easier time shooting it, certainly an easier time reloading it. But, of course, at that time, Colt also had its 1911 available. Yes, so I'm not saying that it's would the have been, best. So, exactly, but, but, you know, I don't think we were... You know, right on the eve of World War I, we were not thinking about supplying Britain with a large number of our guns, which we were going to probably be needing for our own armed forces. Yeah. So given the circumstances, I think um, I'd go with the uh, Mark I number one. Okay. Uh, let's see. JWL asks, were there any serious attempts at stocked revolvers for the military after the early 1900s? That was the short answer. No. All right. Okay. Sorry, I can't really expand on that. <laughs> uh, Ready Fire Aim says the Trejo Model 1 22 automatic pistol. What do you think about it? I think it's a wonderful party gun. <laughs> okay, it's a, it's a fun gun to shoot, impress, impress small gatherings. And then that was at the time when shooting was a socially acceptable function. That's true. Remember that? I mean, well, we don't personally I remember it, but, but you know, I've we've read, about, read about, it. about it and we've seen photos of it where people would have social gatherings and the, the women would visit about the, how unruly the men folk were while the men would go out to the range and shoot. Yeah. And that was, that was kind of a, a normal social gathering, not so much anymore. But in any event, the Trejo, and not that the Trejo was uh, developed during that time period, but it's kind of a fun gun to shoot, but it's really impractical. It doesn't have any kind of a cyclic rate retarder. You pull the trigger, you empty the magazine. The, the good news is that there's not that much recoil, so it's a fun but totally impractical gun. All right. Uh, Will wants to know, what is your take on why the Schwarzlosa 1898 didn't take off commercially, despite its advanced features and good ergonomics? Are, well, are you familiar with the Schwarzlose 1898? I, I, I'm going to guess. So okay. How about if I just give you a generic answer? Okay. And, and like, <laughs> why, why did a well-designed gun not take off during that time period? And anyway, I think there are a number of reasons. I mean, the Schwarzlose is an excellent gun. The ergonomics are, are wonderful. It's yep. balanced nicely. It's got a nice sighting arrangement. I mean, it, it, has, it has all of the right check marks. So the question is, why didn't it do well? And, and this is really a guess on my part, and my guess has to, is that it was just an underfunded project. They didn't have the, uh, the right, uh, enough people in sales. Again, this is, you know, this is in 1898. I mean, this is pre-television, pre-internet, pre-radio. Pre um, you know, they needed a large sales force to knock on a, a lot of doors. The uh, Schwarzlose didn't garner any military contracts. That's what all of the early pistol designers were gunning for, so to speak. They all wanted a military contract because from a, from a firepower standpoint, the development of smokeless powder was just a huge advance. And nobody knew what was just the right mousetrap. People are trying to design guns for their own proprietary ammunition, you know, at, especially at that time, and trying to impress the, um, you know, the military decision makers that they needed to move away from revolvers and consider a semi-automatic. Well, you needed to have people of a, you needed to have an in with people of authority or you needed to knock on an awful lot of doors. And I'm guessing that the, the as far as concerns of short slow said, they were probably just underfunded. That would make sense. Um, I mean, the advantage of a military contract is, of course, first, you're going to sell a lot of guns right. in one go, but then that acts as your advertising. Exactly. Like people become aware of this gun because they used it in the service or they see it used in the service. If you don't have that military contract, like you said, you have to go individually convince every gun shop to stock your gun. That's really hard. That's why inventors would often go to existing companies with that large existing basically marketing force. You take your design to Colt and see if you can sell Colt a license to your design because Colt got that worldwide network to actually market it. Or Eli Whitney. Right. Take it to Whitneyville, because Whitneyville has lots of sales agents, exactly. and they'll make your patent and sell it on their market. Or sell your patent to Mauser. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, But Schwarzlose didn't do any of that. Right. So he just moved on and made machine guns that did sell to the army. Correct. Uh, Adam says, how hard is it finding warlord pistols these days? Well, um, 
Okay, there we Warlord go. Warlord pistols. There we go. <laughs> that's you, our prototype. If, book. That's right. If you if you buy this book and start to page through it, you will find lots of Warlord pistols. <laughs> now, <laughs> I, the I, problem I, is they're only two dimensional. That's exactly right. So, anyway. Um, I, I think, generally speaking, collecting Warlord pistols is pretty challenging. And it's challenging from the standpoint of an American collector, or mm -hmm. maybe even from a you know, Western European collector. It's kind of tough because, number one, we're all used to collecting certain types of guns. Um, we want a specific model. We want certain serial number breakoffs. We're kind of looking for patterns that change. So you want a first variation, you know, 1903. You, here's the first, second, third, fourth, fifth variation. And each one's got a very specific serial range, and every gun in that serial range has got certain characteristics. You have to throw <laughs> all of that out the window when you're collecting Chinese Warlord pistols, because in some cases, the only constant is the serial number. Right. So especially if you're, if you're looking at some of the FN 1900s, we had a group of them that we were looking at, and literally half the guns had the same serial number, 26303. The magazines don't interchange. The parts are not necessarily matching or even numbered. The features are different. The features are different in terms of how each artisan finished the guns. So unless you were lucky enough to get a, you know, an FN 1900 made by the uh, Nanjing Arsenal or the Shanghai Arsenal, it'd be different. So you're not collecting um, examples of a certain niche. You're collecting one of a kind things. So it's almost like collecting paintings. Yeah. So the other thing that we're, we're used to collecting is condition. And believe me, if, if you collect gold damascene guns, you're really anal compulsive about condition. Well, that kind of goes out the window too, because for, most, for the most um, uh, part, these Chinese warlord pistols were issued to peasants who had no culture whatsoever in use of guns, maintenance of guns, care of guns. And in fact, if you look at some of these Warlord pistols, they're not even meant to be field stripped. I mean, it's kind of like some of the, you know, we kind of la laugh about some of the clunkier Russian equipment where if it breaks, you throw it away. But that's actually sort of the case with these yeah. Chinese Warlord pistols. So if they stop functioning, you couldn't, you, 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 you can't, couldn't, fix, you, I mean, you, you can't you, fix them on the field. Yeah. And then if you take them to the armor, because so many of the parts were handmade under shoddy circumstances, it just takes forever to make a part that you hope will fit. So it's actually easier to just throw it away and get another gun. Um, so, you know, the condition of these guns is not really good. And then the other thing is we as collectors, and we kind of talked about that, like what maybe what was the impetus for my writing books, is you like to collect other stuff that other people encourage you to collect. So for example, if there were 10 books out there about Chinese warlord pistols, I'll bet there'd be a lot of you who are collecting Chinese warlord pistols. But if nothing's written, you say, oh, well, I don't know. Why don't I collect Colts or Winchesters? I can find plenty of reference books. Things are nicely pigeonholed. And I should be able to find one, two, three, four or five. I'll get one of each of the 1903 pocket pistols. You can't do that for most of the Chinese Warlord pistols. So yeah. there's a matter of condition, there's a matter of pigeonholing, and there's a matter of just, um, there's a dearth of information. Now, if you say, okay, I'm throwing that all out the window, and I think I'm going to collect Chinese Warlord pistols, I got to tell you, there are not a lot of them out there. Yeah. So if you're in a competition and say, people look at your display and say, oh, well, you know, these are really interesting, but like, what are they? And they move on. What they really don't understand is there are very few of them in this country. And, and it's kind of like, you know, for example, we were kind of laughing about this before. It's like a gun like a Whitney Wolverine. <laughs> like before a reference book came out, nobody would even slow down. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but only a little bit to look at a Whitney Wolverine. A reference book comes out, and all of a sudden, this is a pretty hot commodity. Yeah. I mean, it's a very innovative gun. It was made to be cheaply, used hard, and thrown away wet. Sort of like those Chinese guns, right? <laughs> but, but now there's a reference book, and it'll give you certain serial ranges, and you can actually collect Whitney Wolverines, and there's a little cult that likes them. 
I think to the same to the same thing applies to a certain extent to these Chinese warlord pistols, except honestly they're harder to find than Whitney Wolverines, and it's going to be really hard to pigeonhole them. Right. And one of the reasons is because so many of the guns were literally copied without manufacturer or reference. So if you say I want all the guns made by a you know you can make brand X manufacturer. The thing is, if that manufacturer was intent on deceiving the other warlords at the time and making guns for them, they wouldn't put down any manufacturing identifiers. In fact, what they would do is they'd put on fake, usually Mauser or fake FN stamps, sometimes both, if they wanted to really impress the customer. Double down. It's an and FN and a Mauser. Double down, and then they'd number it with that special 26303. 26063. Yeah. And... And then, they'd, and then they'd sell it. They'd sell not one, they'd sell dozens. I don't know, maybe the hundreds or thousands of them. But then as collectors, we say, well, how many were made and who made it? And those are honestly questions that'll never be answered. Yeah. I hate to say never, but probably never. Yeah. yeah. Next up, we have Ryan. What firearm or firearms are you seeking or wish you could get for your collection? Is there anything you don't actually have? Aside from lever actions that you're not trying to have. Or, or single actions. Yeah. Or, or certain or flint locks. Or, yeah. what, you know. what is it that you really want to find that you'd like to get? Um, you know, that's also a very difficult question. I, I think what most collectors would say, well, I, I don't really know until I find it. But in this case, you know, people say, well, what is, what is a unicorn? Well, it's, it'd basically be a unicorn with maybe two horns. It would be like a bihorn or okay, what, whatever would be the equivalent. I said, what I'd really, really like is one of those Remington 51s that were sized up for 45 ACP. Oh, the M53s. And, and you know, maybe there's yeah. one or two that were ever made, maybe three, four, five, I don't know. The only There's only one that's ever pictured in any of the reference books, and I think it's still owned by the Remington Company or whoever owns the Remington Company now. So, you know, that's been one of my... Uh, yeah, you're you not know, likely to get that one, I'm, I'm not likely to get that one. That's exactly. a good answer, though. But Yeah. Maybe uh, make semi-auto reproduction stuff. Well, maybe I just need to buy the Remington Company. <laughs> you don't want the Remington Company. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> uh, Brian says, I'm starting to collect World War II military sidearms, but I want to focus on the not-so-common military-issue sidearms. What would you consider some of the unsung pistols of World War II? Well, I think that's a really good question with um, a number of equally good answers, depending on what is your focus. So if your focus is, I want a, either a 45 caliber gun or a 9 millimeter gun, I mean, then you kind of end up with a more of a traditional answer. You want the 1911, 11A1, or you want a Luger or P38. Those but are clearly not the unsung guns. Those are not unsung. Maybe they're just not sung loudly enough. I but, think they're um, sung plenty loudly plenty enough. Plenty loudly, okay. Well, you know, some of the unusual guns are, you know, that, that would come to my mind. For example, if you want one of the uh, German Gusloff pistols, or if you wanted an um, Amand Gavage, or if you say, hey, I wanted one of the, uh, I want a rare Nazi Astra pistol. Which one is the rarest? Well, you know, other than, and even a 903 wouldn't be the rarest. It just requires a lot of paperwork. I don't know how many of those are papered in this country, but actually be a, an Astra 200. Okay. <laughs> There's a small number of Astra 200s that were, you know, very well documented as having gone to the, uh, the German army. So I don't know if your, if your consideration of an Astra 200 is a, uh, it's what you had in mind, but it's certainly if you want a scarce gun used in World War II that is not mainstream. Of course, you're, you know, you get an Astra 200 and you're, you show it to your friends and they'll say, well, why did you get They're that little vest? Totally pocket unimpressed pistol? by They're that. They're totally <laughs> unimpressed. So if you want a more impressive gun, then, you know, maybe you want a, a one of the Bulgarian, you know, CC38s. So we were kind of talking about that. Or maybe you want a CZ-27 with one of the extended suppressor barrels, but that's really not a standard issue gun. I think there are, there are so, a lot of things you could choose. I'm going to bring this a little bit back down to earth, because when I read this question, my thought was things that were a bit more available, things that you consider kind of boring. So the three that I would have looked at would be the Beretta 34 series, just even standard Beretta 34s. I think they're a pistol. Obviously, they had a tremendous amount of use in the war, but no one really goes out there extolling how, you know, I have this wonderful collection of Beretta 1934s. Um, 
they're they're I think the definition of unsung. But they're really good pistols. They're, ac- they're excellent pistols. Yeah. And they mm-hmm. saw a tremendous amount of use in the war. Right. Um, I would look at the Czech pistols, which you sort of got into. I think the CZ 24s and 27s and 38s are they're guns that were used by the Czech armed forces and by the Germans as well. And they're interesting and they're, they're kind of unusual. The 24s have rotating barrels. The CZ 38 is almost certainly the ugliest handgun ever made for a military Certainly um, the most overbuilt for a 380. Yeah, exactly. A DAO 380 automatic single stack magazine. Like, what? Right, what? right, what? exactly. Okay, whatever. But maybe you want to get one of the Bulgarians. It's got a cool safety on they it. They are. Right. You're going to have an easier time finding a regular one than a Bulgarian. Right. right. Uh, and then third would be, stereotypically, the French pistols. The French 1935s, right. the A and the S. Uh, there are a couple different varieties of both. Ammunition is now available for them if you want to shoot them. They're going up in price, I think largely because the ammunition is available, but they're still, like, they're nothing like trying to buy 1911s or Lugers or P-38s. They're available, they're very much unsung because they're French and nobody really cares about the French stuff. Um, and particularly the 1935A. I mean, I, I think the they're great, great and it, it's a great gun, and in fact, that kind of leads us back to SIG. So you're almost yeah. buying a SIG because... It's a pattern design. It's a pattern design, and SIG actually based its mm-hmm. P49s and its 210 series on that 1935A. They, yep. The very first of the experimentals was basically an upsized or a 1935A on steroids chambered for nine parabellum. So yeah. that's just a really, it's an excellent choice. Yeah. All right, but back to questions for you. Um, da, 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 da. Bruce says, what is your favorite pistol to shoot? Do you shoot your automatic, your, your collectible pistols, your old early? Actually, that would be an emphatic no. Okay. So <laughs> I don't shoot any. In fact, you know, the ones that we buy for historic investments for, for resale, I mechanically check them out, but I absolutely do not shoot. I don't. You know, Ian and I actually, we were kind of joking about this. I said, you know, I, when I was a lot younger, like maybe 50 years ago, I did my fair share of shooting. And, you know, to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter to me anymore which kind of handgun I'm shooting. Of course, there are going to be differences in sights. And of course, there are going to be differences in trigger pulls, ergonomics, etc. But for the most part, it's not something that I say, gee, shooting this particular handgun is a lot more pleasurable than shooting another handgun. At this point in my life, I'm more interested in the history. I'm more interested in the uh, mechanical developments. I'm more interested in originality. Um, it's, it's, it's a different perspective. Do I have handguns that shoot? And, I, and the answer, of course, is yes, I do. I still enjoy shooting, but it's actually it's the, same, it's the same firearms that I've had for probably half a century now. So what so, is your favorite? So that means I'm not sh- that a Glock is not amongst that battery. You know, so I'll have a, um, it's a Colt 357. It's not the Trooper. It's not a Python. It's kind of a pre-Python. So it's a 357. I've got one of the Smith 52 wad cutters. I really like shooting my high standard citation. Yes, I've got a Smith, um, I've got a 41 and a 46. But between all of those guns, I actually like shooting the high standards. You know, for me, shooting a 50 caliber gun, which kind of hurts my wrist, doesn't give me a great deal of pleasure. In fact, it gives me more pain than pleasure, and it's pretty darn expensive. So when I do go shooting, probably 80, 85 percent of the shooting is with 22s, and I'll kind of okay. finish up the range session with some 9 millimeter and 45. Okay, nice. Let's see. Uh, John wants to know which, if any, of the early semi-automatic pistols do you think could be a success or at least a limited success if it was brought back as a reproduction today? You know, that's a, that's a very good question. And again, there's, there's certainly not a good answer. I think uh, we, we kind of touched earlier about cu- cultural expectations. So if you bring back a gun that you know, if you're watching this channel, you're, you're no doubt interested in collectible firearms. So if you wanted a collectible gun, that's probably a lot more complicated. Maybe it's a flapper delayed or flapper lock gun like a Mazero 608 or one of the 1214 pistols that people, you know, I've, I've seen some of your, your, I've seen actually a lot of your videos and some of the comments and people said, well, if only they brought it back today. Well, the problem is if only they brought it back today, but it's five thousand dollars or eight thousand dollars a pop and then and the number of people in line while very enthusiastic 
while it's still a small line, they're just, it's not going to fly. You need to get a classic gun that can still be produced very economically, and that's kind of a tough thing to do. So I'm not really sure I've got a good answer. I think um, you had some other suggestions. And Part of the problem is if it's an old, unusual pistol that didn't become mainstream produced, there's a good reason for it. There's always a good reason for it, and it's almost always it didn't actually really work that well. And we have a pretty high standard of reliability in firearms today. If you make a reproduction gun and it works 80% of the time, that's going to be a complete failure. You're going to have a ton of angry customers that like once or twice every magazine, it doesn't work. That's well, exactly guess what? right. That's probably how the originals were. No, it's probably yeah, like, better than the originals <laughs> work because at the time there was no standardization of, of ammunition, which is yeah. why a lot of the competitors in the U.S. military trials didn't do well. It's not that their guns were that much worse, but there was a disparity between the ammunition they tested and the ammunition that they were given. Yeah. Now we expect that we can just go to the local gun shop and buy, you know, whether it's Win Winchester, Federal, Remington, any kind of ammunition, and it's and regardless of whether it's a you know a round nose or a pointed nose or a hollow point, if it doesn't work in our gun, we're pretty disappointed. In fact, more than disappointed. And the older guns were not meant for that kind of um, variations in ammunition. If you look at things like nine millimeter today, it's kind of crazy the extent of variation. Like almost a fifty percent difference in bullet weight. You can get 9 millimeter from 115 up to 158 grain, and everyone just expects, well, it's 9 millimeter parabellum, so I should be able work. to dump any dog's lunch mix of this stuff into my pistol and have it work perfectly. That's the sort of thing that didn't just cause guns 100 years ago to malfunction. It caused them to, like, friggin' explode. Right. Like, oh, my right. God, you put 158 grain in your 9 millimeter Noble Trials pistol, the slide's coming off in three pieces. Because exactly. it was designed for, you know, 47 grain wood core stuff. Which um, is a really good reason not to shoot classic pistols with modern ammunition. That is true, yes. Um, so to my mind, if it comes to early automatic pistols, the only one that I think is maybe reasonable to reproduce would be like the Schwarzlose 1898. Because I think fundamentally the mechanics are there for that to be a reliable gun. It's got good ergonomics, it's visually distinctive, they look cool, the ammunition's available. I think you could probably engineer it. You're still gonna end up with a gun that's five or $10,000 a piece, and it will right. be a commercial failure, but it was something you could at least get that far. Um, yeah, things like the early ring trigger guns, I just don't think they were very reliable in the first place. And the reproductions and, and, aren't And going I to think be our expectations are beyond yeah. that. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you get beyond the handful of people who buy them for the cool factor. Which is nice, yeah. but, you know, in terms of making them uh, commercially viable, that's a different question. Yeah. The one that I have said for a while that I think would make sense, and it's not an early auto pistol, it would be a 12-gauge Burgess folder. I think those are mechanically simple enough and historically interesting enough and cool enough that I would think that one of, uh, well, I would have said Norinco, but narinko has got some issues. Maybe one of the Italian manufacturers, if you're making lever actions in Italy, I would think you'd be able to pull off a 12-gauge Burgess folding shotgun for a reasonable price because you could make a reasonable quantity of them to sell. That, that's the thing I would have the most hope for. Yeah, but and that's a good choice. I still don't predict that anyone will actually do it. Uh, I don't think that'll happen, but it's still a good choice. Uh, not Cool says, Will special polymer pistols ever be collectible? Is there such a thing as a special polymer pistol? One could argue the VP-70 counts for its historic significance, its relative rarity, and its awfulness. Um, I struggle to think of anything else interesting or scarce enough, at least from the current perspective. Poly are polymer pistols collectible? Will they be? Is that person's name really not cool? That's his name? That is his name on Patreon. Okay, not cool. Well, that's, an, that's still an interesting question. You know, we were kind of talking about that earlier, and... You know, and my nod would go to maybe the uh, FN57, the earliest guns that have got kind of a figure of eight, a trigger guard. They've already been out of production for a number of years, and I think they've got a very distinctive look, and I think they're already being priced considerably higher than the, uh, the later versions. Um, you had okay. mentioned... Oh, I think all the polymer pistols will become collectible. I think first-generation Glocks already are. Right, exactly. Go try and buy a first-generation Glock and let me know how it goes. Um, 
the things that aren't collectible are generally the things that are in current production. In 20 years, we'll look at polymer pistols the way, like, that's just a normal, old, obsolete pistol. You know, uh, when people started making aluminum rifles, that was, like, that's nonsense, that's total junk, that's not even a real gun. You know, where's the walnut? Uh, and now, is anyone out there saying that early AR-15s, early M-16s aren't collectible? No, of course no, they they're, they're, they're high, very much they're, in demand. They're in very high yeah. demand, yeah. So, so that and, you know, the other thing that we were kind of talking about in one of the earlier videos are, you know, the um, the military version of the uh, the SIG 320s that were just decommissioned, yeah. the M-17s, yeah. they're already very collectible and bringing a significant premium over the commercial guns. and. And I actually think those will be a very good investment gun. Not that the other ones wouldn't too. I mean, the first generation no. Glocks worldwide, we're talking about the Glock sales. I mean, it's amazing how the Glock sales have totally eclipsed the total numbers, you know, that have been manufactured by Colts. I mean, it's phenomenal. Uh, we were looking at the numbers and figuring that it's pretty much a shoe in that there have been more Glocks made than all of John Browning's direct pistols. Exactly. Put and if you're interested in Glocks, what could be better than a first generation Glock? I mean, there you go. Or if you like FNs, what about one of the first FN, you know, polymer pistols, which is that early 5.7? So, you know, unambiguously, yes, there will be collectible polymer pistols. Here's an interesting one. At what point will the Nylon 66 be discovered as a collectible icon? As soon as Len Hunter finishes the book. Len, are you there listening to me? <laughs> okay. Okay. So there, there are actually several people who it's are like actively searching for those Nylon 66s. One of the very first commercial polymer structured guns and, like, and, comes and out for before the, the record, VP70. a lot of those were without serial number did you know that huh. it makes sense so those are like they're yeah. almost ghost guns because they've got a lot of plastic <laughs> in them right that's true a lot of plastic no serial number no serial number <laughs> oh, well i, I think they're exempted now but in any event that's a, that's a different discussion all right and our last question is from james it says i think everybody's heard of john browning probably uh and most people know about in our sphere know about hugo borchardt georg luger who are some other early semi-automatic handgun designers that you think more people ought to be aware of? Who deserves to be known that isn't? Well, that kind of, that, that's uh, another question that if you kind of, okay, if people are interested in a collectible area, they already know about it. So if you're going to explore a new area and you find that new area exciting, which person or people are of uh, paramount interest or responsible for that se for those sectors of firearms? So. I think Joseph Nickel is responsible for popularizing a lot of the rotary um, barrel handguns that we have. Okay. In fact, um, as a result of Joseph Nickel's um, insights, you know, and his designs were taken from Mauser to CZ. There were hundreds and thousands of those guns that have, um, you know, and across several manufacturers. I mean, for example, the uh, if you look at the uh, Obergon 45, that's a rotary barrel gun. So. Mm -hmm. Those are all traced back to Joseph Nickel and the names out there, but it's, you know, it's not a first tier name. Yeah. Uh, the other one is, you know, these Heckler and Cokes now are extraordinarily um, uh, collectible. I mean, even to me, I mean, it's just, it's just, un it, it's, ex it's unbelievable how many people out there are searching for pretty modern guns. And anyway, of the three people that founded the Heckler and Koch, the silent partner was Alex Seidel. Yeah. And Alex Seidel was an engineer for Mauser before he uh, joined up to form the Heckler and Koch company. And he was um, he was he worked very hard in terms of de developing the HK4. Uh, right towards the end of the war, it was Seidel's involvement that was responsible for some of the um, the sheet metal HSCs, and he kind of brought that technology forward into the HK4 and was responsible for you know a host of developments for which he receives almost no recognition. That's a good answer. Yeah. I think there are a lot of guys out there who are kind of one-hit guys, like, you know, um, uh, William Whiting designing the Webley automatic pistols. Right. Like, cool, it's a neat gun, it's a collectible gun, but what else did he do? Some, but that's this one gun that he's really known for. Um, Savage, Arthur Savage. Eh, he's got a rifle and a pistol, but yeah, that's kind of it. But there are some designers out there who are... I. I they, they seem to me to often show up as like small countries arms designers. Like there's the patron arm designer of Finland is Aimo Lati, who had a whole bunch of different designs of very different systems. You know, the, the Lati pistols, the Suomi submachine guns, 
the Lassi Celeranta light machine guns, a lot of different systems that he was working with. Um, Kijiro Nambu is similar. Right. He designs a couple of pistols, and yeah, his pistols aren't really all that highly thought of, but he also had a bunch of, rifle, of uh, machine gun designs that were really excellent. I got to tell you, at the end of the day, though, it's really hard to compete against John Browning. Oh, you can't. I mean, you, yeah, you absolutely can't. I mean, he was just a giant whose work just totally eclipsed everybody, everybody else in the field, whether a gun produced by Colts, gun <laughs> produced by Winchester, guns produced by FN. I mean, it's just extraordinary what it, a prolific designer that guy was. And even though very few of the guns are named John Browning, right? Because he was basically, he sold oh, his designs. So here's the thing. It's hard to find designers who had as many successful guns as John Browning was able to invent categories of guns. Right. Like, John Browning invented the self-loading shotgun. John Browning invented the pistol slide. I, I, you know. An extraordinary person yeah. against it's, others can be compared, but against whom they can't really effectively compete. Right. The only comparison is, you know, who, has, who can come up with the largest fraction of John Browning's accomplishments. <laughs> And to a large extent, he was the right person at the right time in the right place. You know, you could not have had his... He couldn't have invented what he did if he'd been 10 or 20 years earlier or later. Because he was right at that sweet spot right. of the invention of, of smokeless powder, the development of self-loading systems, the development of machine guns. And he's an but, extremely, you know, not only talented oh, and innovative, but a very determined fellow. I mean, yeah. at that time, he made numerous trips across the Atlantic to... You know, try to promote his products to FN when Colt and Winchester were only lukewarm in, in yeah. terms of their reception. Yeah, he was devoted, he was hardworking, he was brilliant. So that's kind of a political anyway. answer. You ask one question and we come right, <laughs> right around to John Browning. But at the end of the day, our, our hats are off, are off to him. Yeah. All right, that's all the questions that I had. Um, a big thanks to everyone on Patreon and Utreon as well who supplied questions. Thank you all very much. You guys make Forgotten Weapons possible. And of course... And thank you very much for having me, Ian. It's a People pleasure, and thanks again for the green screen. I think um, <laughs> the you, real fireplace guy will appreciate the, the you real standing fireplace in for and, him. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was going to say, uh, Forgotten Weapons is also possible because of people like Len, wow. who have amazing collections and uh, give me access to film this really cool stuff, really rare stuff to show to you guys. So, uh, if you're interested, check out his books. There's a ton of information in there. Ian, thank you very much, guys. Take care. <laughs>